The following is a presentation of Tuning Into Sci-Fi TV, the viewer's guide to genre television. Hey everyone, welcome to the Small Council Matters podcast. I am Wendy Hembrock, and the council is in session. So, let's go around the table and introduce yourselves, please. Hey everybody, this is Shannon out in Vancouver, Washington, and let's pour one out for Rainice, the queen who never was. I'm Christine Peruski, your Mistress of Correction. You can like and follow me on Facebook and Instagram. Check out my portfolio at christineperuski.xyz and... I am a barn owl, cursed to live in human form. I am Jesse Jackson from Dallas, Texas. Jesse, at Jesse Jackson DFW on Twitter, aka X. Um, and I am so excited to talk about this one. And by the way, a little plug on my perfectly good podcast. We are discussing John Hyatt's iconic song, Have a Little Faith. And I think that Even if you're a casual fan, that song is so famous, you'll really enjoy it. And I am Wendy, the maester of links and Google documents. Um, Welcome, everyone. We are going to be discussing House of the Dragon, Episode 4 of Season 2, The Red Dragon and the Gold. Uh, We'd love to hear from you. Get ravens and comments. Uh, You can... Join our Discord, and we have a channel specifically about the Game of Thrones universe. You can contact us on social media and uh, x slash Twitter at SCM underscore pod or at tuning into sci-fi. You can also go to our main website, tuning into sci-fi TV dot com and click the link to leave us a voicemail or you can call us. 706-927-8478. We would love to hear from you. So as usual, we're going to just quickly touch on some uh, noteworthy links and news. Um, this season, they've been doing a great job pumping out the house that dragons built uh, behind the scenes, making of the episode. So we'll have a link to um, the most recent episode, and the Battle of Rook's Rest was a big focus in that. Uh, we also have a fun interview with the set decorator who is primarily responsible for all the candles that we see and answering questions about which ones are real, or how do they actually manage all these candles and not set everybody on fire. Uh, it's a very interesting read. Uh, we also have a link to an interview with Ewan Mitchell, who plays Eamon, about uh, what his character was doing in this episode (laughs) in terms of his motivations. Um, And we also have a lot of details about the visual effects for the dragon fight at Rook's Rest. Uh, Right? That's what it's called? Rook's Rook's Rest? Um, That was also really interesting to read. So uh, check that stuff out. And uh, folks, have any thoughts or comments about any of the articles? Well, I think every the listeners have heard me say that I haven't watched The House the Dragons Built uh, each week. But I am caught up now. Uh, and if you're an idiot like me, let me tell you where to find them. Uh, because I kept looking... Because I watch it on the show on DirecTV as it airs live, and I record it. Uh, and then to watch the inside the episode, I go to Max, I go to House of the Dragon, and then there's a tab for extras. And that's where I thought they would be. And I never saw them posted there. But apparently it's its own show that you can add to your watch list. So when I found that, I was like, God, what a moron. Uh, and then I watched the three previous ones Saturday and then watched uh, 204 uh, after the episode ended last night. And those are great. So I'm not telling you things that the rest of the council hasn't already said or that you, dear listener, probably don't already know. But definitely watch those. The size and scale of what they're doing 
uh, each week for these episodes. It's just tremendous. And I know as fans, sometimes we're like, God, why can't these be like every year, you know? Uh, and they, I think they run into the same thing the Game of Thrones did in latter seasons. Well, not running out of source material. That was its own thing. But the, the scale and the number of characters and everything just gets bigger and bigger. And you can't do that overnight. I mean, like that shipyard they built and how they had to rattle, uh, uh, prepare for the battle of Rook's Rest and everything that went into it. Tremendous episode. The other, uh, three are all relatively short and kind of fun. The, you think about somebody's actually lighting all those candles and God, what a, you know, fire risk that is. Uh, I've read several interviews with Ewan Mitchell and he's always very candy about his character saying, well, Eamon or, uh, Eamon could be thinking this or he could be thinking this. You don't know. He plays it close to the vest underneath this facade. Uh, and I think it's a great interpretation of the character, uh, and how he does it. And then the VX, uh, the VFX piece, uh, I talked about like animal comps and, you know, how they, uh, do, you got to do the skeletal structure and then lay the musculature over it before they even get to all the things that George was so wonderful about in describing this as the prettiest dragon in the kingdom or an old fierce lady or, or whatever, and then giving them those personalities. So they're all really worth reading this week. I uh I did get to watch the house that dragons built this time. I seem to be doing all the even episodes so far. <laughs> I just this when I happen to have time for it. This week's was lots of buck work and people bursting into flames. That's always fun. And and speaking of fire, I got to say I really appreciated the article from the set director because I have been wondering about it myself. Uh, like one time somebody was carrying a torch. And I was like, is that real is he actually holding a torch or is it like when they have like a bow and arrow and it's just like a bow and there's nothing loaded in it <laughs> like it, or, or is it actually fire or is it some sort of fake fire and they cgi it up i don't know but it's almost all fire like if you see something on fire it it probably is like they said it was 90 percent real and i just can't imagine the heat in some of those scenes like the uh, the painted table you know, they're sliding the candles underneath. And I'm like, you got all that heat building up. And there's got to be smoke gathering under the table. What is going on? It's insane. So the idea that there is that much fire happening in some of those rooms, especially like in the Sept. Wow. So I really appreciated that article. Yeah, I, I need to check out the articles. But I had watched the House of the Dragon um, you know, extra. And it is wonderful to see all the practical special effects and how they make that flame. And it reminded me, I, I believe it was Pin Gillette who told the story that, you know, he's a fire eater and he's juggled fire and it's no big deal. And so he was going to do uh, for special effects, he was going to be, you know, in a fire suit and get placed on fire. And the stunt coordinator's like, okay, you know, don't worry, this is going to be fine. And Penn's like, ah, it's going to be okay. I'm going to, and he said the moment that fire hit, he was like, why are they waiting so long? Why are they waiting so long? Turn this off, turn this off. And like when they did it, they were like, yeah, that was five seconds or something. I mean, it was just, he said it seemed forever. Um, so I, I do love that the, the, all the stunt people and the fake, uh, burnt, uh, skin and everything. And, uh, whoever plays Cole was very funny when he talks about, I'm just going to mess up this armor of ash. I'm going to push it wrong. And then they're going to have to go reset. So yeah, it was really great, uh, back and forth. And, um, and you got to love Eve going, well, if you're going to go out, going out with a dragon is the way to go. And as I said before recorded, um, she's a fan of the F word, which makes her even more lovable to me. Eve, um, Eve Best was a, a guest on the official, um, HBO podcast as well, her and Alan, Alan Taylor. And she was hilarious because, uh, she was talking about how, um, Ewan, was telling her how fun it is to ride the buck and it's great. He was like, he called it like a life changing experience. And she's like, um, 
and they were giving her pointers when she's on it, like, like swerve like you're on a motorcycle. And she's like, I've never ridden a motorcycle. So <laughs> it was a useless <laughs> direction for her. Um, but, uh, she was really sad, uh, when she had to re- do the read through. She hadn't read the script a- ahead of the table read. So, you know, she was really, um, really overtaken when, uh, they had to do that, that read through. Um, I, she just, she's been outstanding in, in this whole season, the character and the way she portrays it. You know, she really is the queen that should have been. Um, and I'm sure we'll get, get into talking about that a little bit. The other thing I wanted to point out was the woods where they shot this, uh, was actually the same woods that was in Gladiator and the opening of Gladiator. And when the original part started, that was my immediate thought. I was like, wow, that looks like the same woods as Gladiator. Um, so I was, I was thrilled that, that turned out to be the place and that they made such good use of it in very different ways after that one initial shot. Um, it was cool. Uh, and, uh, just all of these were really interesting in different ways. So if you have a spare, you know, 20, 30 minutes, take the time to uh, follow the links and read. And the visual effects article has lots of great screen grabs too. So, um, that's fun to look at. So again, um, we appreciate folks sharing things as well. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about some listener feedback we got this week. Uh, first of all, a friend of the show, Davia, sent in some thoughts. And um, like Shannon, wanted to um, uh, definitely give a shout out for Rainey's. And um, however, she recognized that the moment she met her husband's bastard son, Alan, uh, she knew that Rainey's was going down, <laughs> for the foreshadowing. Um, she also wondered how did Bela miss Eamon on the biggest dragon, not being anywhere around, not seeing the dragon um, lead, lead, lead out of uh, the Red Keep at all. Um, so maybe her reconnaissance isn't that great. And uh, she also is not a fan of the greens, but for the first time in this uh, story, she picked Eamon as favorite character. Um, and that was based on the scene where, uh, she, where, uh, Eamon speaks to him in high Valyrian and, uh, was finally, you know, somebody really clearly articulating the strategy and the tactics and, um, was hoping that Eamon, would actually finish off Aegon. Um, and for her, that's yet another reason to hate Cole, because he interrupted that, possibly. And um, she's also a little disappointed in Rhaenyra. Um, she gets that she doesn't want to start the war, but at least stand up some defense for uh, your supporters um, as well. And the small council, uh, the Black Council has really been very dysfunctional, doing everything short of treason to undermine her. Um, dragons aren't the only weapon, so uh, think about uh, allies and offense a little bit more. And also, based on the preview for next week, uh, Davia was uh, speculating that um, Aegon is taking the credit for taking down Rhaenys, um and continue to win the public relations war. Uh, any thoughts, folks? Yeah, thanks for the feedback, as always, Davia. Um, I knew what was coming, uh, so uh, I was pretty sad about Rainey's. Uh I, What's interesting is the way that they handled meeting the bastard son there. She took it a lot better and was super classy about it, as opposed to being like, Oh, I feel betrayed and, and all that. Uh, it was an interesting way they did that. I think the thing about Bela missing Aemon and Vagar, like she had to come back and report, you know, so maybe at some point when she was not there and not patrolling, that's when the big old honking dragon came in. And then the way they had it disguised under all the trees and limbs and everything, 
even if you have terrific eyesight, I think that was a pretty good disguise, like in the forest right there, rather than having him on the battlefield and signaling uh, your intentions. So I agree with you about Eamon being like the best uh, strategic mind on the show, more so than Damon or Rhaenyra or Allison or, you know, Laris is a schemer and kind of there. I would put him as like a 1A. Uh, and Otto is a good schemer, but a schemer, a cautious schemer. Whereas, you know, Eamon and Kristen Cole, you got to give him credit. He and Eamon developed a good plan. Um, so, uh, yeah, thanks for your feedback. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Davia. Um, I, I do agree. I think Vagar wasn't out there when Bela was. Eamon was also at the council table around the same time that she was. So that's a big reason why she wouldn't have spotted them. Also, she was really having troubles uh, seeing their movements because they were keeping to the trees and only moving at night. She said that she thought they were heading west when in fact they were heading northeast. So she really didn't know where they were anymore. Uh, I'm not going to blame her for that because, you know, it's a solid tactic hiding in the trees. Unless you want to burn down all of the trees in the land. I don't recommend that. But I am also loving Eamon. Uh, recently, HBO, or, or sorry, the Max app, uh, had prompted me to choose my side, which really meant choosing uh, one of the new avatars available from House of the Dragon. Now, I didn't want to pick green because I didn't want to give them the wrong impression they might be taking demographics from this. So I picked uh, Damon as my avatar, but... I would have picked Eamon because he is very much one of my favorites out there. And like, I can't tell you which one's more entertaining, uh, Eamon or Damon. They, they sound similar enough anyway. <laughs> um, I, I do hope that he's essentially taken out Aegon. I'm getting the impression that he's not quite dead yet. Uh, but it, to me, it was clear that he was about to sheathe his store, sword before Cole walked up. The angle he had that he was holding when Cole stopped him was like backward and down. He was not about to stab anybody. So I don't think Cole interrupted anything. He he wasn't, you know, going to overtly kill his brother. Just, you know, accidentally, maybe. So <laughs> I'm not going to place the blame on Cole for that one. I just, it was a mercy killing. I did think of the, thank you, Davia, for the feedback. Um, and as usual, I think in terms of songs, and I'm now Spamalots, I'm not dead yet, <laughs> is going through my mind. Uh, this was, yeah, I, I think a lot of things you mentioned are really worth, um, acknowledging and talking about. I, I'm gonna agree with everyone else. I think that the, um, super secret weapon was, came in after Bale had already left. Um, and I do find myself admiring Eamon more than I would have thought I would. Um, there is, there is another story where he, he is the hero of the story. He was picked on as a kid. He lost an eye. He somehow, you know, tamed the, the, this ferocious beast. Um, he is very wise when I was watching it. And w if one of us picks the brother talk as a, as a topic, you know, I'll talk a little bit more of then, but yeah, I've got to say that while I'm team green, um, he's, he's really earned my respect. You mean team black? <laughs> yeah. You're... Yes. Yes. Team you're black. Team Rhaenyra, yeah. Right? Team Rhaenyra. Yes. <laughs> uh yeah, oh I, I definitely agree with that uh thought about Eamon. He's um really stepped up in uh representing um also he was the one who studied his high Valyrian, uh <laughs> as was very obvious. Um and uh, that was really interesting, especially to contrast with when we've had Damon and Rhaenyra speaking high Valyrian to each other. Um so it was that same connection, brother connection, but it was also very clear from the body language by anybody who couldn't translate that, uh, you know, he was taking down his brother <laughs> around the
that table. Uh, so great shout out, um, for that, uh, that, uh, particular one, uh, Davia. And, uh, we appreciate your comments as always. Uh, we also got, um, some comments from Denise in our Discord. Um, and like Shannon wanted to, uh, pour one out for Rainice. Uh, she went out like a champ, uh, just as she did in the books. Um, there are still some shifts in the books. All three of the dragons were entangled and go down. Um, and, uh, it was clear in the book that it was never Eamon's intent to take out his brother, unlike what uh, maybe the show is implying. Um, Sunfire is a tough dragon though. And, uh, maybe expect to see Sunfire again. Um, and, uh, is also wondering, you know, this show is really emphasizing the whole Song of Ice and Fire, Prince It Was Promised, uh, prophecy stuff, um, and is a little bit tired of it, I would say, because we, we know that. We know what happens. So, um, wondering if we could be like, yada, 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 could care less at this point. Are we going to get some new information? Why keep bringing it up? Um, it was also nice to see the, the battle between the dragons, though she, uh, preferred the one in the book to what was on screen. Um, and again, that was partially due to maybe the showrunner's motivations, uh, for characters that, uh, were not the same as in the books. Um, and it's also funny to see people who are angry at Vagar for being such a, lethal dragon uh but uh denise doesn't get mad at vagar because uh you know she's just doing what dragons do and following the lead of her dragon rider and this was lena's dragon before amon's so um you know again hate the hate the game not the player uh thank you denise for your thoughts yeah, thanks, Denise. <clears throat> uh, as far as the dragon battles, I'm going to talk about that very shortly. Uh, as far as the Song of Ice and Fire part, uh, I think they are going to that well a lot, but it's just briefly. And, you know, as something that wasn't in the books, I really, I'm, I'm sure that Ryan talked about this with George and I don't know if George suggested it or they did it as a way to, because like in the, in the fire and blood books, you don't get a lot of character motivation. You're just, it's like newspaper clippings, people reporting on the fact years later. <clears throat> so I like that it gives Viserys something. It creates that deathbed confession that gives a reason for the schism versus just, well, Allison is greedy and wanted to run the country. And, you know, I, I think it adds a lot of layers to both sides, the greens and the blacks. And I, uh, enjoyed the scenes of Allison this week looking for books and scrolls and trying to find out more about it, you know, because she's thinking, Oh God, maybe I was wrong about this. Uh, and then, and I like when, uh, Rhaenyra, revealed it to Jace. I, you know, so yeah, they are banging that drum, but I think it adds a lot of really good, uh, colors for the characters to, to play and gives them some motivations beyond just, I want to be in charge and I want a crown. Um, so, and yeah, dragon's going to do what dragon's going to do. You know, I don't necessarily blame them. You know, uh, if I was a sheep, I might be angry, but you know, in terms of battle and war, that's, that's what happens. Uh, but thanks for your comments, Denise. We appreciate it. Yes, thank you, Denise. Um, the book accounting that you're talking about sounds solidly like propaganda to me. I mean, they would never record that Aegon wasn't supposed to be there, that he flew in foolishly against advice, and, and they would never report that his own brother was trying to kill him. They would never do that. That's not something that's going to make it into the history books. So I've, again, this is where I feel like they're allowed that leeway because it's not, the story in the book isn't being told um, as it's happening. It's being told, I'm guessing, hundreds of years later by someone digging through history, digging through uh, letters and official reports, stuff that can be, you know, manipulated. and. And have lots of holes in it, like Vagar's wings. <laughs> um, 
And it sounds like the description of the battle in the book was much more, you know, pleasing to you. But I got to ask, in the book, did you get the impression of like when Vagar starts to come up over the tree line? Dun-na, dun-na, dun-na. Cause, cause that, the moment I saw those wings, I'm like, oh, that is scary right there. Can, did they give you that feeling in the book? Did you, did you get that sense? I don't know. I feel like that's something you can really only do on screen. But I agree. You are, we are hearing a lot about the song of ice and fire. And, uh, Shannon, you're like, you know, this makes good motivation. We don't, we don't get to hear people's motivations in a historical accounting. Um, it, so it does make sense that it's in there, but we are hearing about it quite a bit and, you know, spending a lot of time on it. And, you know, unless we've got poor writing happening, I think there's got to be a little bit more to it than that. Like it's got to be something significant that we're building towards or just, you know, like accumulating along the way. I don't know. It it feels like eventually the motivation's going to, you know, be worn thin for us. So and I'm hoping there's something more to it in the end. Thank you, Denise. Um, So I'm going to jump off my throne of sunshine for a moment. Every time they bring up uh, the, you know, story of ice and fire, I go, why are they reminding us of a show that didn't stick the landing? Like, why are they keep bringing up this that didn't end well? I mean, let's move on. This is not where we wanted. And like, it just brings up all the things that we were unhappy with about those final few episodes. So, um, yeah, I'm it, it, and I also kind of in a way go, and was the ice and fire that important, right? When it all comes down to it, right? Like if it had been this epic and, and it was a great series, but I don't feel like they, and, and if we had ended with them destroying the, you know, the, the ice monster and everything, but no, we had all this other stuff. So anyway, I agree with you. I'm like, move on. Let's go on. We've got other stuff to talk about. But uh, thanks for sharing, and I appreciate it. And uh, please, please keep the comments coming in. Yes, thank you, Denise. Um, Jesse, that's very interesting how hearing about the the prophecy makes you um, recall not so fondly uh, some of the flaws of Game of Thrones. That that's interesting, you know, and I guess part of it is listening to the actual showrunners because they've talked about the idea of prophecy and how much does that motivate action or not motivate action and um, how that will actually play out in, in the motivations of characters. So that's why, to me, it's it's still relevant. It It could get overdone if we get more of it because... In this episode in particular, we had, um, as Shannon mentioned, Allison, you know, doing some detective work to figure out if she was wrong. Um, and then we also had Al, um, Rhaenyra reading Jason to it, you know, just in case, uh, something happens to her. So I like that and also how they layered it over the, the start of the battle and people who are relevant to why um Rhaenyra thinks that, you know, she needs to be the ruler because she's trying to um keep the realm together. So it, it works for me in this episode. You know, I don't really need to hear a lot more um unless we have another sort of changing of the guard on us at some point uh, where we need to read somebody else into the prophecy. Uh, the thing I liked, um we didn't talk about last week, was how um Rhaenyra doesn't describe it to Alicent as a prophecy. She calls it a story. And I thought that that was very um telling that she chose to use that word. Thanks again, Denise, for your comments. Um And we'd love to hear comments and feedback. So uh, keep sending them in, please. So now let's move on into a little more discussion. But first we're going to do quick reviews and ratings. So let's go around the table. 
What a great episode. Uh, I, uh, I'm going to give this one a 9.5 and I keep a little spreadsheet of all my ratings. And I think that's tied with maybe the Black Queen from last year as my highest rated episode of the series thus far. I thought it hit on every cylinder and there were many things in it that I love. We got the epic scale dragon battle at the end, uh, things we have not necessarily seen before. We had lots of council meetings. I love council meetings, you know, smart people or dumb people talking in, uh, lovely rooms. Uh, we had some emotional stakes. We had some interesting character turns, uh, great acting, unbelievable visual effects and practical effects. Uh, a terrific episode. Finally, things are moving, infighting, dragon fighting, people on fire, lots of death, some big, some small, the life of the king in question, Damon and Alicent feeling more guilt, creepy dream sequences, which is what I wanted more of, a little drug-induced time loss, still a little too much bickering around tables for my taste. I know, Shannon, you seem to like that, but it's becoming a little one note for me. Also, Shannon's doing this weird, like, tenth of a point rating system, making it like a whole 100 point system. I'm sticking with whole numbers here, guys. So I give this one 9 out of 10 stone chairs that don't move. Yeah, this, I really liked last week's episode, but, you know, as I mentioned, I didn't feel like there was a standout scene, like, oh, And this one, there obviously was a great standout scene, but there were two or three others that I went, wow, okay, that's going to be a good to dive into. Oh, that'll be good to dive into. Um, It was just really, really well done. And it it moved very quickly. Um, The story moved well. uh, And just like everything talked about, not only the epic dragon battle but the chess pieces being moved and the discussion was really great um and one of the things that we didn't mention i I just want to go back really quick um in the official game of thrones podcast where they have the director talking about it um he mentions that he has directed episodes and spoilers that where ned died Wild Bill Hitchcock, Christopher from The Sopranos, and Caesar on Rome. So he's like, hey, you need a main character dying, I'm your guy. So in honor of that, I'm going to give this 9 out of 10 directors who kill off fun characters. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Um, yeah, this episode had a lot in it. Uh Damon wrestles with his regrets. Uh, Rhaenyra returns to this divided council. Cole incites Team Black to send a dragon and engage and it really lights the match on the, this whole thing. And, uh, we lose the, the wisest best council, Rhaenys, uh, who dies valiantly in battle, unlike some other ways that people have gone out <laughs> in the Game of Thrones universe. Uh, looking at you, uh, Tywin Lannister and, and others. Uh, so I would give this a 9.7 cups of Alice Rivers Weirwood Paste cocktail. And, uh, nice. let's now get into the highlights. So, uh, Shannon, let's start with you. Yeah. As Jesse noted, when I did my second watch, uh, through this morning, I write down all the scenes and then I highlight ones that I think could be a good one to choose to talk about. Uh, and I had six, uh, that I could have chosen from to speak. So, uh, my favorite was probably Aegon knocking that pitcher off the table, just like a cat. I just got a new kitten and I was like, I just saw this happen 30 minutes ago. So that cracked me (laughs) up, but of course I'm going to go with dragons, dragons, dragons. Um, I love the way it started. Uh, as a book reader, I know it was coming and they, uh, managed to surprise me with a couple of different elements. For example, in the book, Aegon was always part of the plan with Kristen and Aemon. Uh, and they were going to get two on one dragon fight. 
as part of the strategy. <clears throat> but the way that they handled this, I think, makes it much better for all the characters involved. And as Christine earlier noted, you know, that's propaganda. If they said, like, oh, Aegon was part of the plan all along, you know, and he's a conquering hero, and he helped fell the dragon Melis, and... Uh, you know, and it'll be interesting to see if that's the way they spin it. They probably will next week, depending on what happens. But then it adds a whole new dynamic to Amon and uh, Aegon. So, but the way it starts, it was like, you know, soldiers at the ready and everything. And I, speaking of cats, uh, it was very cat-like how Vagar kind of woke up a little bit from under the tree limbs and whatever, and then just sat back down uh, once he told him to wait. Uh but yeah, the signal sent, I got like, you know, feelings of Lord of the Rings when they're lighting the fires and sending the signal, uh, you know, and then Cole was like, well, where is he? You know, and then all of a sudden here comes a God on his dragon. Uh, and it just, and then they would do ground shots, sky shots, point of view shots from dragon riders, like, uh, you know, sometimes when you're seeing people drive a car in a movie, they're like from the hood at the, through the windshield at the driver. We had those kind of shots. All the shots look fantastic. We were speaking a little bit pregame about how when Danny rode a dragon or somebody else and she was on the buck, it looked good, but it sometimes it looked a little fakey. The stuff they're doing with the dragon riders, uh, especially this year is just remarkable. Uh, so the way the battle went out, and, uh, and then the dragon fighting. Yeah, you have the fire, but it was like, so how did they do it in the air? And Alan Taylor, I think it was on the inside the episode or, or maybe an article I read. It was like they studied birds of prey and how birds of prey would attack each other and then go in with the talons and wrap their wings around and, you know, bite at parts. It, it seemed like, oh yeah, that's how dragons fight. It, it was just spectacularly rendered. And within all of that, you've got such delicious character moments. You've got like, <clears throat> Aegon, uh, coming in and he's coming in because he had been, smacked around by Allison, by his counsel, by his brother and everything else, and just being told to be a failure and do nothing. That's what's required of you. So he's like, damn it, I'm going to suit up and go. <clears throat> and then Amon, man, this adds so many layers to his character. We saw when he snacked on poor little Luke that there was like a tinge of regret and maybe I can't control Vagar. And this time that was cold and cunning and Dracarys, you know, he had him right in his sights as Aegon's going, go oh, thank the gods. He's here to rescue me. Uh, so, and then Rhaenys' character, like, you know, after she, uh, scores a big one on Aegon and Sunfire, and then Vagar comes out, she manages to get out and she could have at that moment escaped back because at least according to the lore, maybe not from some slight damage, uh, but Melisa is the fastest dragon in the, Seven Kingdoms. So she could have gotten away, and but she, the look on her face, she said it all. You know, that ashy covered face of, I'm going to go back and fight, and she knows she probably won't win. Just great character moments for everybody, and just beautifully visually rendered and directed by Alan Taylor. So Shannon, I, uh, I didn't exactly have this in my top two. I kind of had the lead up to this. I, I called it the downfall of King Aegon the second, literally downfall. Um, but you did mention some of the stuff that led up to it. Yeah. I really wanted to focus on what got us here. And, you know, it started with Aegon freaking out about Damon taking Heron Hall and everyone in the room being unfazed by this. And he's, he is hyper focused on Heron Hall because he clearly hasn't seen the state of it. <laughs> and, um, that, that is when Eamon steps in, all cool and relaxed, gives him the update that that's not what we're doing. Uh, we're taking this little nothing castle instead. And for people, uh, who may not, uh, really understand the geography of the situation here, um, so what we've got is, um, uh, Blackwater Bay, uh, it starts at like King's Landing. And kind of at the southwest tip of the bay. And that, then it goes, uh, up to the, sorry, up to the northeast, uh, 
and widens out, and Dragonstone is kind of at the mouth of the bay. But if you go straight west from Dragonstone over to the, the shoreline, the, the mainland, that's where Rook's Rest is. That's what this is all about. You know, so they worked their way up, building up the army to get up to Rook's Rest, specifically because it is right there, right next to Dragonstone. And they were trying to draw a dragon out. That that was the plan that Amond and Cole were talking about in that first episode. We didn't get to hear that much of it, but it was a canny plan, as Cole put it. And they just didn't bother to loop the king in on it. So Aegon's all riled up because no one's consulting him. But Aemon's out for blood, you know, emotionally speaking. And he gets Aemon back for that little scene at the brothel and starts casually pointing out Aegon's, Aegon's flaws by belittling him in High Valerian. And it's so clear that he is not fluent. I mean, nobody else in the room speaks High Valerian, but they they can tell something's happening here. You know, Aemon's doing all the talking, and then he stops talking, and then they they wait, and then they look over at the king who just has nothing, you know? He can't even speak one sentence properly. He essentially speaks in lolcats. Yeah, I can have to make a war? I can have cheeseburger? <laughs> so that was the first push. And then the conversation with Mummy Dearest later on pushes him further. She She points out more of his flaws, mostly that he doesn't know what he's doing and isn't even trying to learn from people who would help him. I mean, he he got rid of dad's books. He didn't burn them. No, he made a point of that. I did not burn them. I just removed them. But then she says, we just need you to do, just do what we need you to do, which is nothing, which is the most demoralizing thing. I mean, everybody wants to feel needed, right? So that that's what led to all this. It pushes him to do something dramatic after knocking the pitcher off the table. Hey. There's your sorbiquet. Aegon the lolcat. <laughs> but he flies off to battle, not even knowing that Aemon is there. Because, again, he's out of the loop. And then we see Aemon make a choice. Like, he, he gets the call, and he's ready to go. And then he sees his brother flying over. And says, idiot. And he decides to let him screw up. He's like, you know what? I'm going to wait until he gets all screwed up about, by this. And you know what? It'll be a great distraction. I'll I'll be able to take her out, no problem. And so we're left at the end of this battle wondering two things. Did Aemon hope his brother would die in the blast? And did he? Because we aren't quite sure. It's clear that Sunfire is still kind of breathing at the end there. But Aemon, or Aegon, is not moving. So... It's a little unclear. We're getting the impression that he's not dead yet, but I can't imagine he's going to, you know, do really well after this. Yeah, especially with the wonderful maesters, they'll they'll put leeches on the burned body, right? Um, this was so well filmed, and and a lot of little touches. Like, I knew we were losing uh, Renice when she whispers to her dragon once more, old oh girl, right? And there is such a sweetness and a sense of inedibility, right? Like, I know where this is going and there's nothing I can do to stop it. Um, And then I thought, uh, you know, our... um. Aegon, no one likes, but his dragon does. His dragon gives him a little, oh, look, I know you're drunk and I know you aren't worth a damn, but you're still my guy, right? And I thought that was a sweet little moment. Um, you know, I, I thought, is dragon blood poisonous? Because, you know, they, when one of them rips the other one, the blood falls on all the soldiers. And I was wondering, like, does it, burn is it you know because you often in uh fantasy books dragon blood is incredibly valuable for different traits so you wondered about that um and you know cole waking up waking up and i remember i i was in an american i was in a a world history 
when I was a freshman in college and the professor talked about how World War One, all of a sudden the world changed because all this technology that had happened had never been used in a battlefield before. And it was, oh my God, we are now more efficient at killing each other. Um, and, you know, I know they talked about like a, a pre nuclear war and a post, you know, after the bomb. But I thought of even that earlier thought. Um, it was just a, and I normally am like, okay, enough with the battle scenes. Come on. Cause I'm more about the character moments, but. This was so well just choreographed and watching the dragons go for each other's neck and the scratching and the burning of each other. And, and you're going, are dragons immune to fire, right? Can't, or is it one fire? And then, you know, and it appears that dra- they're, they are not, are there different species of dragons? Because we seem to not find you know, the every dragon looks unique, like a different species. And, and it was just fascinating to watch. And I knew when she, when Renice told, you know, her dragon, you know, like, we're going to go, I knew that we were going to lose her. I just, and so the whole fight, I just knew that she was going to die. And even when she looks like she's getting away, I just, knew that there was going to come up from the depths, right? Like the shark or, you know, Captain Kirk's Enterprise on Wrath of Khan, right? This just coming up. And then just when they grab that neck and cut it off and you see the dragon dying and her falling, you're like, that was, that was amazing. And so I was just really, really, you know, I was like, wow. That was that was just so well done. Yeah, uh, definitely a highlight for me. Um, the, the thing that I really appreciated was this battle wasn't like any other battle we've seen in Game of Thrones because um, it's really a dogfight in the air, <laughs> you know, a dragon dogfight. And it starts out with the troops on the ground and, you know, they're going to take this castle, no problem, right? You know, you have, I don't know, 10 guys shooting arrows off the top of the castle. And, you know, they have overwhelming force. Um, and, uh, and then we have Rhaenys arrive and she's doing some pretty serious damage on her own. Um, and, uh, you know, if, Aegon had just been a little bit later, you know, she might have gotten most of this battle done before he arrived. And then um once he joins, I, I agree, Jesse, the, the dragons are all very distinct from each other, which was great um to to see what was happening. Um and I had also uh heard Alan Taylor talk about the research that he and um, his visualization, uh, person, I forget her name, um, had done about birds of prey. And it was amazing when, um, you know, I expected Rainice's dragon, which is much larger than Sunfire to be able to, you know, do some damage there. But then when Vagar enters, I was like, Oh no, <laughs> you know, this is not good. And that was where we see the real skill of Rhaenys because she's got the dragon upside down. She's clawing out its guts. The guts are pouring out like boiling oil onto the soldiers underground. The the part that was really um, significant to me and something we had not seen in Game of Thrones at all was when Vagar hits the ground and it's like, you know, a meteorite <laughs> hits, you know, the huge percussion. Um, that's what knocks Cole and his horse out. Um, and 
you know, I would argue that Vagar took out as many of the greens as uh, Rainey's did <laughs> with uh, Melis. So that was all really well done. And the, we also got Cole really terrified. I mean, he's like, what is this? You know, he, and he's been all in command, right? Kingmaker, everybody's bowing to him. And then once he sees this real dragon fight, he's like completely flummoxed. Um, you know, he probably has a concussion. Um, and he's also effectively taken out of the battle because once he sees Aegon go down, he's going off to chase to find him. And he hears Gawain saying, okay, let's go through the breach. Um, and that moment when Rhaenys, you know, she's, she's, looks at the dragon and is like, we're going back. And, you know, it, it's just the resignation on her face. But she had already done a little bit of damage to Vagar, So it wasn't like a complete fool's errand. You know, it was just a long shot that she might have been able to to take out Vagar or do enough damage to Vagar that, you know, maybe could make a difference in the war. Um, and that was the thing that was so poignant about this because she's been the person all along, even all the way back to season one, talking about these boys, they've never been in war. They don't really know what they're asking for. And when, um, Rhaenyra comes back to the council and everyone understands you need to send a dragon in to help hold this castle, um, you know, she says that she'll go and she is the right person to go. She's the most experienced person there because Damon isn't there. And um it, it was just really, really well done. I, I mean, all the way around in terms of the characters and how they participated in this battle. You know, Aegon was really a non-factor <laughs> in terms of, he had no clue what to do uh once he got there other than yell Dracarys which was like the first word that any dragon rider was ever taught as a kid. So it was like the most basic thing. Um, and also we talked a little bit about Amond. It was super cool when the dragons laying in the woods, there, all camouflaged and then kind of flops back down. It was like, okay, it's not my time yet. Um, and I was, Similar to Christine's comment earlier about hearing the, the Jaws theme, I was totally expecting something horrible to happen. <laughs> and it was. I mean, when the poor Melissa's neck is crunched and the, the expression that they put on its face as it's looking back at, um, Rainice, I mean, that's all fake, right? <laughs> but it's so, you know, it was able to, um, evoke so much emotion from me. And then it was beautiful when, um, Renice realizes she's, th- it's over and she just lets it go and just floats down. And then they literally breach the castle when, when the dragon explodes onto the ground. It was, um, it, it was really amazing. Uh, and you know, I'm not like, yay, carnage. I, I mean, that's not why it was cool. It was, we've always heard about how powerful and fearsome dragons are. And we got a lot of the burning element in Game of Thrones, but now you really got to see that this is a whole new, uh, level of, um, uh, warfare. And nobody's really equipped to deal with it at this point. So great choice, Shannon. So, Christine, you kind of talked about your highlight. Do you want to talk about it a little more? Actually, I have a, a separate one that I was... You know, okay, great. Um, although I do want to say a few more things about the, the dragons. Uh, uh, While well, Vagar did remind me very much of Jaws coming in, uh, when she was on the ground, you know, and we just got to see her legs and like her belly. I was like, it's Godzilla. <laughs> like just squishing <laughs> yep. people. And also, Jesse, you were asking about uh, the dragon blood. Uh, I had a few thoughts. Like I did wonder, you know, if it was like acid or something. 
Wendy, you mentioned uh, really hot. I imagine dragon blood is very hot simply by being, you know, in the dragon that's breathing fire, but also just the weight of it. I mean, honestly, those guys that got hit with the blood got hit with a ton of weight coming down hard. So, I mean, you don't need any special properties to just be taken out by dragon blood like that. But since, uh, since all the dragon stuff and the Aegon stuff was, was talked about in length, I'm going to go with my, my other highlight, Damon's guilt dreams. I'm just going to be talking about, you know, the, the creepy witchy stuff happening here. Um, first off, we get Millie Elcock again. Yay. And she's, now she's doing a reverse scene uh, of the one that introduced us to Damon. This time she's sitting on the throne as he approaches. Now she's speaking High Valerian again, but he's having trouble understanding. And I'm wondering if this means he's feeling that he's veered too far from family. Like Rhaenyra gives him a, and us a rundown of everything he's been feeling, but not, sh- uh, <clears throat> feeling, but not sharing. And he promptly cuts her head off for it. Not that it, it shuts her up. Um, but I mean, like it was very telling that she was speaking high Valerian and he wasn't. And he was actually saying, speak plainly. It's like, have have you lost your way, Damon? Do you no longer understand this family language? Very telling. Um, and then the next dream we get uh, is uh, he hears someone outside his room drawing a sword. And we see a figure striving purposefully through the castle. And it looks very much like Eamon from behind. But it turns out that it's Damon wearing an eye patch. How very Empire Strikes Back. Um... I'm guessing he feels responsible for how Eamon just turned out. Uh, honestly, I think on this one, he's being a little too hard on himself for that. Because, I mean, he was barely around Eamon. The... So, I... maybe he feels responsible for trying to kill Eamon and how that turned out. It's a very complex story there. But at the end of that, he finds himself in Witchy McCreepy's laboratory. And she probably introduces herself. Now we know Alice Rivers. Thank you for the name. And when he walks in, she's already working on a sleeping tonic, I'm guessing. And now I get this. She licks her fingers off before cleaning the rest of it off. And I think she does this to kind of gain Eamon's trust or Damon's trust. The the names, they rhyme. Um, But um, so she has all that like, crushed up berries or whatever that she put in there and she was licking, but then she adds I'm what's I'm guessing supposed to be hot water to it, you know, to make it the full tonic. That could have been anything. There could have been anything in that picture. She didn't touch it, but he fell for it and drank it. And then he loses time. But during this conversation, we hear a little about the weirwood trees and how black Heron, who, you know, the castle that's his castle that he made. That's why it's called Heron hall. In the process, he cut down a whole grove of weirwood trees, which just seems like a really dumb idea to me. Oh, by the way, Damon's been sleeping on one, so that's good. I'm sure that's healthy. And then she also starts voicing everything he's been feeling guilty about, like everything he's been dreaming about, really. So you have to wonder if, like, is she really a witch? Just very intuitive. Or is she listening in while he's dreaming? Is he, like, vocalizing his dreams while he's dreaming them and she's just, you know, listening? You know, I always wonder how um, these mystical people pull off what they're doing. Are they actually mystical or are they just really good at getting the, the intel? But I love this little horror story that's going on in the middle of this political war and how it's getting woven into it. It's like a lovely little mental break from all the the infighting and politics and warmongering. It's just totally separate, a different tone, and it it, it's like we can take a breath and and watch something different in the middle of it. I I don't know how long it's going to last, but I hope it goes on a little longer. Yeah, I loved this scenes and it. You know, Alice was such a lovable character and the oddity of, no, I'm not a woman. I'm a bar now. <laughs> Just um, a couple things. One, it 
does look like she could be doing a cold reading. You know, for people who pretend to be psychics, there is warm readings and cold readings, and there is ways where you can use other clues to get it right. But, you know, if I could veer off just for a moment, um, several years ago, there was a huge ice storm when Dallas was going to host the Super Bowl. And I slipped and landed on the ice. And I remember standing up and my friend's like, you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. All right, so we're going to go to lunch. And the next thing I know, I'm sitting at the table at Payway. And I said, did I order lunch? And they go, yeah, Jesse, you ordered lunch. Did I order lunch? Yeah, you ordered lunch, Jesse. Okay, I realize I'm asking this the third time. Are you telling me I ordered this meal? And they then all of a sudden looked at me like, yeah. And so I ended up going to the marriage room and I had a concussion. And I cannot remember. I remember getting in the car and then I remember sitting at the table. Nothing else. So Damon was like, what? And, you know, and I thought it was so funny. You asked me to come, and well, as I told you, he was, and David is just like, and you know, and he's so, I understand you want an army, doesn't everyone? So, yeah, I think that this, and she did nail it perfect, right? Like, you lost your throne, um, you know, you're unhappy that you're, um, you know, your brother loved me, his child, more than he loves his sibling, right? And, and this other thing, and then like, and the person you bounced on your knee, well, I want to go, yeah, but later, um, bedded, right? <laughs> Which, let's get past that, uh, is doing that. So yeah, I think that's amazing that we're in this haunted, crazy place that who knows what vapors are causing all this. And I do think, Damon, Damon, you wouldn't eat peas and venison, but some strange person who flat tells you that she's a cursed owl and you down that just without asking. So great choice. I, I It was on my list of things to talk about. Uh, yeah, this was definitely on my list as well. Um, cause I, Damon is just one of my favorite characters. And I think all of these things can be true. I think that, um, Heron, uh, built on curse land, right? He wiped out the, the weirwood forest, um, used the, the carcasses of the were trees to build the furniture. <laughs> <laughs> um supposedly the slave's blood um is mixed in with the mortar in the 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 um the walls so there's just a lot of bad mojo in this place um it also is definitely true that Damon is exercising uh his actual demon regrets that's going on she probably roofied him with, uh, they called that paste from the weirwood trees something specific, but I forgot what it is. Um, and she's probably really canny about people. Uh, you know, when she explains her logic about you come here, you take this castle, you don't call home to your wife and tell her, you know, start sending the luggage or anything. Um, and, she must know, as everybody does, that he's demanding to be called your grace. So, you know, she could guess and, and obviously knows his history a little bit. Um, I loved the actual visions that he had, you know, the one that was the mirror of the first time we see him interact with Rhaenyra from, from season one. And, um, they made it funny too, you know, cause after he beheads her and the head's talking to him and then it says, um, you know, there's a raven and I was just expecting it to say like, do you smell bacon or something? Um, the, uh, 
the one where he's chasing what appears to be Amon and it turns out to be Damon. Um, to me, that was kind of foreshadowing about how this character is so much like him and it's also going to be his downfall. Um, I think. And then, um, the, then the conversation that he has in the kitchen, Alice Rivers is a very intriguing character. So I hope we have a lot more conversations with her. Um, because, uh, there was also just a lot of curiosity in Damon's side about what, what is going on. Um, and it, it's, a uh, it's been very interesting. So, so a great choice. I, I really enjoyed this as a highlight as well. Yeah, I had this as one of my favorites as well. You guys have covered most of the things, uh, that I would have said about it. I appreciate the fact that we're adding levity again, uh, in this, uh, uh Gail Rankin, uh, who portrayed Alice Rivers was terrific casting. People may remember her as the she wolf on glow the wrestling drama on Netflix. That's probably where I saw her first. Uh, and she's a Scottish actress, and they let her keep her natural Scottish lilt, and I thought that added a lot to the character. Uh, it was kind of sing-songy and just, you know, with some of the stuff she said, it just made her appear a little more eccentric, and you could understand why Damon kind of cocked his head and looked at her and was intrigued. Um the other thing I appreciated <clears throat> on one of the behind the scenes things, they talked about how they didn't want to shoot sleepwalking or dreams or visions in the typical way where everything is gauzy and wavy and you go, doo-doo, 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 you know, and you go in and out of it, uh, like that. So, uh, it gave it a, an eerier feeling and their dialogue was great. And I, and I was going to make the point too. The guy won't need a pee, but yet yeah, just here. I'll drink this. Uh, and the way she was making it was, you know, it, they, they had that dialed up for maximum ick, the slopping of the muck in the bowl and the licking the fingers and the flicking off of the detritus and whatever. Uh, so it was, it was funny, eerie, and you could understand why Damon was captivated. I thought that was a really entertaining scene. So I'm going to go back to Christine, uh, mom and mom and son meeting. And I'll kind of use this as an excuse to talk about the king's kind of his interaction with his court in multiple ways. Um, there are, I'm, I've been very vocal about how much I love Aaron Sorkin's work. And one of the things that in Sports Night, Robert Guillaume says the line, if you're dumb, you surround yourself with smart people. If you're smart, you surround yourself with smart people who disagree with you. And that has been something that I've kept to heart in whatever management role I have. And I will say that I feel a little bit sorry for him because, you know, he wasn't trained. He, 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 and obviously he is not someone who's going to go out and find things himself, right? Like his brother did. His brother like, oh, I don't have a dragon, so I'm going to force myself to, to pay attention to my lessons and I'm going to learn, you know, our, our ancient, uh, you know, uh, language. And then, you know, oh, mommy, I'm bored and they're not nice to me and no one's listening to me. And to be fair, Alice is just done with it, right? I, I'm, I may be pregnant, so I've had to take this horrible brew to make sure that I don't have an illegitimate kid. I'm sick to my stomach. Um, I'm tired of your whining. And instead of saying, you know, a wise ruler, listen, and and then you will, you know, there's a reason why uh, all the gods gave us two ears and one mouth, 
right? No, she's just like, your job's to shut up and do nothing. Not be quiet and learn and you will grow, you know? No, just your job's to do nothing. You sit there, you be a pretty little face, and I have no business. And so he gets drunk. And he's like, I'm going to show them. Point of thing, flying while drinking, never a good idea. So I just really liked, it's a small scene, but it really gave the motivation, as Christine talked about, of what led to the big dragon fight. And so I just thought that was really a really well done because, you know, and, and I feel for Alicent that just, I'm just tired of this crap, right? And so I, I just think that was really interesting and I loved watching the dynamics. Yeah, that that's a great choice. I mean, it's... um it's pivotal, right? Because that's the thing that actually pushes him over to go get completely wasted, which leads to him uh, deciding that he's going to uh, go and help. And uh, the thing about Allison is she's, this happens a lot with her, right? Uh, when the kids actually need the mom to give them some, some uh, mother, motherly, Touch, love, affection. She's got none of it to give <laughs> at this point. She's been tossed off the council. She's sick because she had to take this moon tea. She had to put up with Lara Strong coming in and poking and prodding at her. Um, she's finding out that she's wrong and getting either no information from the maester um, or we, we're not sure what she's gotten out of the histories that she's found so far. But um, it, it's got to be pretty disheartening to recognize that the thing that you had worked so hard to put this kid on the throne and... um you know, it's not, it's not panning out. He's not, he's not following the script, which by the way, they never gave him the script. So, um, you know, shame on them. And it's, it's all chickens coming home to roost. Um, but I got to give huge props to the actor playing Aegon because he's doing a fantastic job of making me feel actual sympathy for him. You know, he did not want this job. He was kicking and screaming and hiding under the table. I don't want <laughs> this job. He knows himself. He knows he's not the right guy. And um he he's not getting the right support around him. He doesn't understand really how much um damage his bullying did to his relationship with his brother. He he doesn't he doesn't hate his brother. He just thinks this is all boys being boys and he's the older brother. So, um, he's entitled to picking on the, the little guy, the little weird kid. Um, he thinks that they, uh, until this council meeting where he's like, you're talking behind my back. Um, and when, Amon actually starts to, you know, show some some fangs towards him. He he was talking about how, you know, Amon's a loyal dog like two episodes ago. And now he's starting to realize, you know, everything that he's thought he understood is is just wrong. So the actor's doing a great job of of showing that um He's lost, he's confused, he's lonely, he's grieving his child. Um, you know, th this could be a character that you just despise. And he's really not. I don't despise him as a character. I, I do feel bad for him. I don't, you know, condone his choices. But even when he goes to see the dragon, right, <laughs> his dragon is like, dude, what's up? You know, <laughs> he's kind of headbutting him. Um, and I'm sure the dragon thinks they're just going out for a joy ride. <laughs> the dragon's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, uh, 
<laughs> sign up for this. <laughs> and uh, I almost half expected him to flee the battle, um, but, you know, once it got a little dicey. So a uh, great choice, uh, Jesse. I really like it. Wendy, you make an excellent point about Tom Glenn Carney there, because like and we've had, you know, bad kings throughout this saga and somebody like Joffrey, Jack Gleason also did a great acting job doing somebody who was just rotten to the core, you know, and he was like hissable and booable. But the, the nuance that Tom Glenn Carney brings to Aegon, you do feel a little sympathy for him. You can see how, like, I'm being left out of everything and nobody trusts me. But then he also lays the seeds, like, for his own destruction because he didn't have to do that to Aemon last week in the brothel, you know? But he did, and he just went on and on and on. Uh, he could have studied High Valerian like Aemon uh, and most of the other children that are part of the Targaryen dynasty, but he didn't. You know, and so he just keeps making messes, even though he thinks he doesn't deserve it, but he doesn't do anything to overcome that to deserve it. Uh, and so I liked how this scene was kind of the final thing that propels him to, uh, do what was not in the books and ride Sunfire in is not part of a plan, but just cause he's like, I've got to do something to prove my worth, you know? And the other thing, um, Oh my goodness, was Allison good in that scene? Uh, she was just so over it. And, you know, with all the things, Jesse, you mentioned, he's like, do you think wearing a crown just automatically gives you wisdom? You know, and, and he's like stammers and doesn't know what to think about that. And he's like, tread carefully or something like that. She's like, what are you going to do? Hang me like the rat catchers? You know, she has just taken none of his stuff right there. Uh, and then at the end, just do exactly what is expected of you. Nothing. You know, and that's the thought we leave him with as he goes to put on his armor and, and goes to see Sunfire. And actually, Wendy, you made a good point. I feel bad about Sunfire because it was like that when you come home from work or whatever and your kitten comes up and gives you that little head button nuzzle, you know, Sun, Sunfire didn't ask for any of this. So, uh, yeah, excellent choice. And I love that scene. You see, Aegon was never challenged the way that Aemon was. Aemon had to fight for everything he has. Everything was just handed to Aegon, just like the crown. He wasn't even really ever punished for his mistakes. Alicent just cleaned up after him, like with the girl he raped. And, you know, to expect him to be better than what they made him was stupid on all of their parts. And Alicent, she gets so mad about the books... She never told him he should start reading them. All he saw was a waste of space. She never ensured that he had a tutor for High Valerian. We saw Jace working hard to get just the syntax right. We never saw Aegon learning anything. All I know is that Allison is going to be beating herself up so much after this. I mean, that was the last thing she said to her son. Do nothing. <laughs> and I wouldn't be surprised if she started flogging herself. And this this is that roller coaster of guilt I was talking about. That that is Allison's role from this point forward. Hmm, that's that's interesting. Um, because uh, we don't know. I mean, we don't. We know only from the trailer that presumably Aegon isn't dead. It it would have been better if they had not shown him at all <laughs> in that trailer because. At the end, I cl I really couldn't figure out if he was supposed to be dead or not. I knew the dragon was alive, but I couldn't tell. Um, and the responses of Cole and Amond to what they saw was very interesting because Cole is devastated, maybe because he's worried about the blame that's coming to him because he's the one who's going to get completely blamed for everything that went wrong in this plan. Um versus Eamon is like, I found a knife, <laughs> you know, because he's got the new Valerian steel dagger and he just kind of walks off like he is. Um, it, 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 there was no uh, sort of hurry to him at all in response, in responding to what he saw. But um say that, you know, Aegon is alive, but incapacitated in some way. 
I could very much see Allison walking in that room and be like, I told you to do nothing <laughs> and, and blame him for <laughs> what's happened. Um, so I could see it go either way, uh, from that perspective. So that was a great choice, um, as well. Um, we went through kind of the, the best highlights, but I'm going to go. I'm going to go back to Rainice because we're not going to see her anymore. And I just want to go back to the scene with, um, uh, Alan when she goes to the dry dock and, uh, Davia had said, Oh, when that scene happened, I knew she was a goner because you don't have <laughs> a nice reconciliation scene like that unless something bad's going to happen. Um, And it underscored to me just the importance of Rhaenys as a character because she's the one who's always seeing the bigger picture. And in the, in the episode last week, or maybe it was two weeks before, she's talking to Corliss and they're out in the rain and she's saying, you know, you need to name Bela, right? Because Joffrey's too little. What if something happens to you? We're at war, right? And she's thinking of the big picture. But she isn't actually thinking about the big picture of who replaces me if I go down in the battle. She's so concerned about Driftmark and Corliss getting taken out and hasn't recognized how important she's been as a, as a counselor and a steady hand. And in this, um, episode, the, the other council, it calls her out and says, you weren't appointed the hand, you know, you don't have any more relevance than the rest of us. And it's like, but clearly she does. And, um, so I thought it was interesting that she wasn't a little bit more forceful with Corliss about, you know, you need to recognize and legitimize this, this bastard here. Um, but it was a, again, an example where, She's thinking about the bigger picture. You should, you should recognize what he did for you, not what this news means to me personally, which is you had some side piece and a kid and, uh, you know, what that did to her personally, um, for that. And even the whole idea that she's supporting Rhaenyra, which we never got any conversation where Rhaenyra says, uh, Laner's alive, you know. <laughs> Wait, so she still thinks that she and Damon orchestrated his death to some extent. You know, she just trusts her. So, um, you know, for me, those were some of the, the last couple scenes that, uh, I wanted to, to point out because uh, again, I think Eve Best really elevated Rhaenyra. You know, she was the role model of how to be the queen. Um, you know, and that, that wise counsel and trying to, um, help Rainier as much as possible, as well as, you know, minimize the damage that she knew was going to be coming once, once the dragons were involved. So that was mine. That's a really good choice and, and kudos for highlighting Eve Best. Terrific work there. Uh, from the books, you know, nobody, the change to let Lanor live uh, is an interesting, and we'll see how that comes back with Sea Smoke in the future and what that means for dragon lore and claiming and writers and whatever. Uh, but they also changed some of the ages of the characters because the rumors in the book was that Alan was a bastard of Lanor. Uh, but the way the characters are aged in the show, that it's clear that you know, unless he was having affairs when he was two or something, uh, that wasn't going to be a possibility. Uh, so you think, I guess Alan's supposed to be mid twenties or something like that. So you get the sense that this was a long ago thing. Corliss was maybe at sea, got lonely, whatever. And then they've been so loving in everything we've seen from them since that she's healed her heart and got past it and still respects him. And even at this moment in time when there's wars going on and all this other stuff, uh, what a grace note for her to look at him, know who he is, and say, your mother must have been very beautiful. I think that's just such a classy and cool thing to say. Uh, and you can tell she still <clears throat> cares about Corliss and still cares about the bigger picture things, as you were saying, uh, Wendy. Because when Corliss comes up, what was it he said? Um, uh, where has that woman gone? 
talking about Rhaenyra. So he's still kind of testing yes. towards Rhaenyra, you know, because maybe he still holds a grudge because of the the death of his uh, children to both Damon and Rhaenyra. Um, he's worried about the heir and where the heck has Rhaenyra gone and, and all of that. But she soothes him and gets him back on track kind of before she heads out. So it was just a lovely little grace note in that scene between the two of them. Yeah, this scene really makes it clear that we've lost an MVP in this war. And, uh, God, I don't know where this is going after this. I mean, somebody's got to step up and start taking charge because she was really important to the Blacks. And she was stellar in this scene. There is so much emotion on her face when she's looking him over, saying that his mother must have been very beautiful. And I, it's, it's clear to me that she, at this point, doesn't care. I mean, she said he's not responsible for his past. So she doesn't blame him at all for what is clearly Lord Corliss's bastard. Like, it, it's it's made pretty clear. And she's she's planning out the future. I mean, she's been trying to push him to name a new heir, and he doesn't like the the options. And she sees this man who not only has the blood right, but has all the skills that Corliss has been talking about. You know, he knows the sea. He's, he's a good ship, right? And, um, he saved Lord Corliss's life. I mean, he, he, he knows what he's doing and he needs, to, I think she was trying to hint that he needs to make him his heir and, or if not his heir, something important, you know, he's worthy of bigger things. And, it's taken us way too long to get to this point. Like, I felt this scene should have been the second Alan scene we saw. You know, we got too many, too many Alan scenes before this. Like, the first introduction, it was with Lord Corliss, him saying that, uh, they say you're the one who pulled me out of the water. Good introduction. Fine. We need to make him more important, more interesting to us. This scene would have done it. And it didn't have to be the one, the last time that she would be there before she went off to her death. It could have been, we're making this guy more important by giving him more backstory related to the characters we already know. I felt this scene on the Alan side of things came a little late and would have, you know, made the other scenes a little more worthwhile leading up to this point. But I am glad we got this scene, we got to see how Rainey's felt about him before we see what happens with him further on. This was a great scene. Yeah, a couple things, right? She's going, um, you know, your mother was a fine girl. What a good wife you would be. But my husband's life and love is the sea. Um, sorry, I had to throw that in there. Okay, here is, if Caitlin Stark right had been as understanding as Rainey's we have no problems in Game of Thrones right <laughs> this is how it's done <laughs> I mean that's a great that's point. great <laughs> I mean, like, yeah. she is like look I mean um yeah and I get the same feeling if she isn't saying make him legitimate She's at least saying, look, they saved your life. He saved your life. You should be honoring him. You should be giving him. And I also agree with you. Instead of him and his brother or cousin talking about, you know, carrots in the stew, if this had been the follow-up episode, you're like, oh, okay. Now I see this. This makes a lot of sense. Um, and by the way, very few Monday morning quarterback on storytelling of this, of this season. I, I, you know, I feel overall they've done really well. Um, yeah. So I, I thought this was really well done. And this shows once again, you know, and Yves is just the best. Pardon the pun, but. The idea of 
putting everyone else's what is best in the long run is what I'm playing the long game and shown what a good queen she would have been. Especially if Verceris was just, I mean, great guy, but not a good king. And if he could have been just a scholar and making his little, you know, castles and doing his studying, I mean, the the kingdom would have been in better shape. So, so well done, so well. And um, in the behind the scenes, the actor who plays Corliss talked about, we've become really good friends. And so it was a little sad. He says, we'll remain friends, but it's going to be a little sad that I won't get to have it. And there are very few strong marriages, healthy marriages in this world. And this was one, while it may have its flaws, overall, you know, they cared about each other. They respected each other. And uh, and there was true love and affection. Yeah, they they were real partners. Um, you know, they were flawed flawed people, but uh they definitely ha- had a solid marriage. So, any other highlights folks want to shout out? Okay, what about anything that you consider a ding or a low light or a head scratcher? No, for this one, I didn't have any dings on it at all. Uh just Tremendous, good pacing, well acted, well filmed. Uh, that's why it's got a high score. For me, it's just a. Uh, I'm getting a little tired of the bickering at the council tables. It's gone on for several episodes now, and it's it's getting repetitive, and it's time for a change. And I hope that the death of Rainice is going to uh, flip a switch, and at least on the black side. I feel like they could just shut those guys up and have someone step up and take charge. You know, they said they were rudderless. Let's get them a rudder, please, because I'm sick of hearing all the same stuff. Well, you're not doing what we want you to do. And we and you your intel sucks and and all the like if like what are you doing, guys? What are you doing? You know, you're just I keep hearing the same crap. You you got nothing. It's old. It's stale. So that's my only dings. Like, okay, I hope this is the last episode we hear this. Yeah, I I think really well said that there is um, neither council is that very strong. Um, My only ding, and I'm going to kick a a prophecy down again, like uh, the whole Song of Ice and Fire. You know, I feel like what they're trying to do is do this um the phantom right the the phantom dies and the phantom son takes over and you know does the you know does the oath on the skull and there is this one after another this long legacy or almost like a green lantern that oath right like you've gone they're trying to make it feel like that and it doesn't work for me so it's a small minor quibble, but when you were talking about that, that's what I thought of. I think that's what they're trying to make happen, and so far it hasn't clicked for me yet. We shall take no wives. We shall have no children. <laughs> it's not not, uh, not not quite the same oath. Um, this is not a ding so much as a, a lost opportunity. Because I, I would have expected there to be a scene between Corliss and, uh, Rainey's before she leaves. They did not have a, a farewell, you know, and he has to recognize how high the stakes are too. Um, you know, it's probably cut for time or just imply that, you know, she's gone into battle before, so didn't need to. But that, that was probably my one. And I wouldn't call it a ding. It was really just more of a missed opportunity for, for that one last character moment. Um, and I'm hoping, Christine, that the loss of our MVP does make everybody level up on Team Black uh, in the next episode. So we shall see. So with that, any other final thoughts before we go? 
Don't drink and fly. <laughs> Very true. Very true. All right. Well, before we go, I want to thank all of our listeners. Uh, we really appreciate you. We would love to hear from you as well if you have thoughts to share. Um, and I want to thank our council members, uh, Shannon, Christine, and Jesse. It was always a great time. And we're going to close this session and we will see you again next week. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye. Beware of flying sharks. We'd love to hear our listeners' voice thoughts and send us feedback. Call us at 706-927-8478. Stop by our tuning into sci-fi tv.com blog to record a speak pipe message or check the show notes and leave us comments. From the blog, you can also find links to forum discussions and subscribe to our RSS feed. Call in to our Tuning Into Sci-Fi TV Skype account and leave us a message. Be social with us on our Tuning Into Sci-Fi TV Facebook page or follow us at Tuning Into Sci-Fi on Twitter. You've been listening to Small Council Matters from Tuning Into Sci-Fi TV, Episode 114, recorded July 9th, 2024.